Since I had a little downtime on the Not So Tiny House project while waiting on the insulation to be installed, I figured I'd get another quick project knocked out. And after being away from working in the shop for almost eight months now, it was really nice to get back to working in there. So the project I decided to work on was a big outdoor dining table for the new paver patio area, and I decided to try working with a new material in this project, GFRC, or Glass Fiber Reinforced Concrete. The first step in the project was to build a form for the concrete, and melamine is really the perfect choice here, as its smooth surface doesn't stick to concrete and leaves your piece with a pretty much flawless surface if you do things correctly. So after cutting the pieces for the form to size at the table saw and miter saw, I can get the form assembled using screws. Unfortunately, my favorite countersink bit didn't work well in this application, so I switched to my other favorite countersink bit, which is made by Rockler. And both of these bits feature a depth stop, which in my opinion is a must-have feature on countersink bits. And these inch and a quarter square drive screws are also another Rockler favorite of mine, and you've probably seen me use them in other projects, and I always get questions about the bits and screws I use, and I'll link to both of these in the video description below in case you're interested. And as you can see, this tabletop is pretty large, and I basically made it as long as I could with a single sheet of melamine about 97 inches long and roughly 40 inches wide. After the form was assembled, I vacuumed off the entire surface, then hit it with some compressed air to get everything the vacuum hadn't picked up, and finally I wiped the whole form down with acetone off camera to remove any oils, leftover adhesive from the dang barcode sticker, and other impurities from the form, all of which would translate into the final concrete piece. Next, pulling a page out of my buddy Mike from Industrial Maker's book, I wiped down the inside corners where I'd be applying the silicone caulk with paste wax to make it easier to remove the excess caulk later. Finally, I could add a bead of black silicone caulk, since it's easier to see, to all of the seams inside the form, which not only seals them, but with some shaping, will add an edge profile to the top edges of the finished tabletop. To shape those edge profiles, I used a fondant ball tool, another trick I picked up from Mike, and this gives the caulk a rounded profile while pressing any excess to each side of the bead. I added way too much here, so I had to switch over to a larger ball tool, and I did run into some issues where the three beads met up in the corners, but overall this trick leaves you with a really nice finished edge on your concrete. While the silicone dried, I went ahead and got my foam insulation board cut to size, and these pieces were added during the casting later to help reduce the overall weight of the piece. And as you can see, I arranged the foam in a way that left full thickness concrete around the edges and where the metal legs I used would be mounted, along with another full thickness strip in the center for some added strength. I left the silicone to fully set up overnight, and the next day I came back and peeled away the excess caulk, which was super simple since that fondant tool leaves a clean line between the excess and the corner bead. You can also kind of see in this shot some of the wrinkling towards the corners that made it through to the final piece, and it was nothing major, but I would try to avoid this more on future concrete projects. Before casting the concrete, I needed to <laughs> dexterify my shop, as Mike puts it, covering all of the surfaces around the form with plastic. And I should have added way more plastic here, and I'm gonna have little bits of concrete around my shop for months to come. So with that, I was ready for casting, and the first step there was to mix up the face coat, which was sprayed into the form with a hopper gun to give me the smoothest finished surface. And I decided to go for as close to black as I could get for the color of the top, and I used Fishstone's black iron oxide pigment to dye my concrete, and I added the maximum recommended amount, just over two pounds per 45 pound bag of their GFRC mix. I also weighed out my water and initially added about 80% of the total 8 pounds of water I was going to be adding to my mixing bucket before adding the GFRC mix. And this GFRC mix is made by Fishstone and it really couldn't be simpler to use. You just need to add water, mix it up, and it's good to go for the face coat, which doesn't have any of those glass fibers added. Fishstone also set me up with this amazing Colomix concrete mixer, and while you could obviously mix this stuff with a corded drill and a mixing bit, this mixer made my life a lot easier while mixing the seven bags required for this tabletop. After getting things slightly mixed, I added the rest of the water and thought I had a good consistency for spraying, but in retrospect, this was way, way too thick. And to solve this, I could have added some plasticizer, which helps the concrete flow out without adding more water. Anyway, once I had the face coat mixed up, I got some of it loaded into the hopper gun and started spraying it into the form, immediately realizing that I hadn't put down nearly enough plastic. 
And when spraying GFRC into a form, you want to work backwards, overlapping your previous strokes and covering the entire surface with roughly an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch of material. And working backwards helps to keep air and sand from getting trapped in the final surface of the casting, which did happen to me in one spot on the back left corner of the table in this shot, since that was the last part that I sprayed. After spraying, I came back with a chip brush to smooth everything out and help to make sure there weren't any trapped air bubbles. Since my mix was so thick, I really hadn't gotten the coverage I was looking for, so I added some of that plasticizer and added another coat. It was also at this point that I realized I had forgotten to adjust the PSI on my compressor, so I was blasting the mix through at about 100 PSI when it should have been closer to 25 PSI. Eventually, I got the second coat added and repeated the chip brushing process, then I left the face coat to cure for a few hours just so it hardened enough so the back coats wouldn't push through. And the face coat was still a little bit soft to the touch at this point, but certainly wasn't fully cured and had plenty of moisture left, which is the most important thing for good adhesion between the face and back coats. Speaking of the backer coat, next it was time to get the first layer of backer coat mixed up, which was the same process as the face coat, adding the water, then the GFRC mix, then the pigment, and I did upgrade to a larger, wider mixing tub, and this made a huge difference versus mixing in that five gallon bucket. After thoroughly mixing, I could add what really makes GFRC work, the glass fibers. And these fibers act sort of the same way as rebar, increasing the concrete's tensile strength, but they're a lot easier for thinner projects like this since you don't have to worry about the rebar popping through your finished surface. Once the fibers were mixed in, I could bring the bucket inside and get the first layer of back coat added. And this coat should be applied fairly thin. I applied this first backer coat at just over a quarter of an inch thick. And then I used these compacting rollers from Fishstone to help bond the back coat to the face coat. And this also helps to remove any air pockets between the two layers. I repeated the process on the other half of the form, mixing up another bag off camera, hand packing the back coat and then compacting it, and also made sure to work the concrete up onto the vertical edges to start building up those areas and also compact those surfaces as well. I added another batch of concrete to bring the thickness to roughly three quarters of an inch, using the rollers again to help smooth everything out, and then I could add those foam panels. And the panels were half an inch thick, so they were set below the top of the form by about a quarter of an inch at this point. And in retrospect, I wouldn't have done things this way since trying to cover these foam pieces was a total pain. And I came up with what I thought would be a good solution, 3D printing some quarter inch thick washers, which I could clamp below some wooden pieces to keep the foam from floating. But trying to add concrete around these pieces ended up being really difficult, <laughs> as you'll see. Once those pieces were in place, I could mix up the final batches of GFRC, and my goal was to make these a little bit thinner so they'd flow out more easily. Unfortunately, the concrete was still fairly thick and I was having a lot of trouble getting the concrete under those wooden pieces. So I kind of furiously pulled off the wooden pieces and filled up the rest of the form. And it was at this point that I realized I didn't really have a good way to smooth the back surface since I don't have any trowels here at the shop that are big enough. So I tried something I knew was kind of a no-no with GFRC, screeding the surface, and as you can see, that really only made things worse. So at this point, I probably could have gotten the surface a little smoother using those compacting rollers, but I was kind of at my wits end, so I just threw a piece of plastic over the piece and called it a day. The piece sat there for about a week before I finally came back to get it unwrapped, and man, this thing was unbelievably heavy at this point. I guess that shouldn't have been surprising since I used 7 45 pound bags of concrete plus 8 pounds of water for each bag, most of which was still in the piece, plus the full sheet of melamine for the form, so <laughs> this tabletop in the form probably weighed over 400 pounds. Because I didn't really want to cover my entire shop with concrete dust, I wanted to do the grinding work to clean things up outside, but first Eddie and I had to figure out how to get the tabletop out there. And we initially thought we might be able to carry it, but there was no chance that was happening, so we moved to plan B and used a pair of dollies to wheel it to the back door. Since, of course, the area behind my shop is gravel, we had to get a little creative and used a few pieces of plywood to allow us to still use the dollies outside. Finally, we made it to the sawhorses, but it was still a little questionable whether they'd actually hold the weight. Thankfully, they did, and I even hopped up onto the table just to make sure they weren't going to collapse while I was grinding the top and land on my feet. 
With that, I could get masked up and start the arduous process of grinding the bottom of the table. And I used a diamond cup wheel on my angle grinder here, the same thing I used on the concrete guitar I built, and this thing cuts through concrete like butter. I started by removing the excess from around the edges of the form since I was going to use the form itself as reference to flatten the areas where the legs would mount. And then I went around and knocked off any of the sharp pieces since the last thing I wanted was someone to cut their legs when sitting at the table. Once that was done, I pulled out a level to use as a straight edge and started flattening the areas where I'd be mounting the metal legs. And I marked out these areas using a Sharpie so I didn't have to spend all day grinding. And thankfully, I didn't actually have that much work to do to get things cleaned up. I repeated the process at the other end and then went over the entire surface one more time just to further knock down any high spots. And again, this all could have been avoided had I done some trowel work to smooth out the back face when casting, and I'll definitely be more prepared for this in the future. Anyway, with that grinding done, it was finally time for the moment of truth, removing the form. This is definitely the most exciting and kind of the most nerve wracking part of any concrete project as you really don't know what your project's gonna look like. And overall, I was really happy with how clean the edges were here. Definitely not perfect, but I was gonna grind those sharp edges on the bottom off anyway, so a lot of these perfections would be removed. Speaking of which, I pulled out the grinder again and knocked off those sharp edges, basically chamfering the bottom edges. Once that was done, I blew off any excess dust and then it was time for kind of the real moment of truth, flipping the table over so I could see the top. Thankfully, this went smoothly and the sawhorses held and kind of unbelievably, the top surface was incredibly smooth. So one thing you might be noticing is that the tabletop actually started to sag. I think because it wasn't even close to fully cured, so I ran inside and grabbed some 2x4s to throw under the top to support it. And thankfully, once the top was up on the 2x4s, it flattened back out, but you definitely want to support it in the middle while it's curing. Next, it was time to polish the top, which helped even out the color and smoothed out the transitions around the edges. And for some reason, I decided to start with the lowest grit in this set of diamond polishing pads. I didn't really know if the grits corresponded to kind of sandpaper grits. And the lowest grit was 50 grit, and this was way too low considering how smooth this top was already. This 50 grit pad left some scratches that were a real pain to get out. I ended up spending a lot more time polishing than I really needed to because of this. In retrospect, I probably would have started with 200 grit pad if I had to do it over again. After polishing, I left the top to dry out and continue curing for a few days, and it was time to seal it. And I used another Fishstone product here, their U-Seal Concrete Sealer, and it's a two-part mix that you then dilute for the first few coats to help it soak into the concrete more readily. Once it was mixed and diluted, I rolled on the first coat of U-Seal starting on the edges, and you can see how quickly the concrete soaked this stuff up. And on this first coat, I left some kind of puddles in spots, and I would really try to avoid this, as some of these areas soaked in before I could get to them and are still darker than the other areas, even after all three coats of finish were applied. After applying the first coat, I dry rolled the surface to remove any excess sealer, which can cause modeling and unevenness in the color on the top, and then I let that first coat dry. I repeated the process for two more coats, diluting the sealer less each coat, and it is crazy to see watching back this footage how much this top was still absorbing on that last coat. This concrete was very thirsty. So for the legs on this table, I decided to go with these metal legs from Rockler here, and I was really impressed with their quality. I obviously could have welded these myself, but I was in a bit of a time crunch, and I think these are a great option if you're not set up to weld your own legs. Now, as you can see, I also decided to add an apron on the long edges of the table just to help support that long six foot span between the legs. And I used some two inch angle iron for this. To end up with the most strength, I decided to overlap the angle iron onto the mounting plate for the legs so that I could attach the aprons both to the top and to the legs themselves. Before figuring out where the aprons would attach to the legs, I got the legs positioned where I had left the top at full thickness and marked out the mounting holes on the table so I could drill them out later. I repeated the process at the other end and then set the angle iron pieces in place so I could mark out where I needed to drill holes to attach them to the top as well as to the legs themselves. I then headed over to the drill press to drill the holes, making sure to add cutting fluid to keep from burning up my drill bit. And once the holes were drilled, I could move outside to get the pieces painted to match the legs. Before paint, I cleaned off all the cutting fluid and Sharpie and loose rust with some acetone and then sprayed on a few coats of spray paint. 
While the paint dried, I went ahead and drilled the mounting holes on the underside of the top using a hammer drill and masonry bit. And I used a piece of painter's tape as my depth stop here and just made sure to remove as much of the dust as I could from the holes after drilling so the screws didn't get bound up. Next, I could get the legs attached using some inch and a quarter tapcon screws with a lock washer and flat washer to keep them from loosening up over time. With the legs attached and the paint dry, I got the apron set in place, attaching the screws through the mounting plate on the legs, and then I center punched the hole locations for the bolts to attach the aprons to the legs. To drill and tap these holes, I used this little combination bit that drills, taps, and countersinks the hole all in one pass. And I absolutely love this bit for this kind of thing. Now, I'll link to it in the video description below, and I'd highly recommend it if you need to drill and tap a bunch of holes in steel. Once that was done, I could loosely attach the apron through the mounting plate and get the aprons attached to the legs using the newly tapped holes. And I also went back and added lock washers to these bolts as well, just to keep them nice and tight over time. I repeated the process at the other three corners of the table and then attached the apron to the center of the table using a few more Tapcon screws in that full thickness center section to really lock the base to the top. Finally, I could check the top for any flex and this apron really tightened everything up, whereas there was a touch of flex before that and I was worried that might worsen over time. The last thing to do before bringing the table over to the house to the new patio was to add some pieces of HDPE plastic to the bottoms of the legs to keep the steel from scratching up my new porcelain pavers. I cut four pieces to size and then used some Total Boat 5-Minute Epoxy to attach them to the legs, although I should mention that they <laughs> popped right off after this first application since I didn't scuff up the powder coating in those areas and it was just too slick for the epoxy to bond to properly. After adding a layer of epoxy, I clamped the pieces to the bottom of the legs using a scrap piece of wood to help spread out the clamping pressure. And with that, I could disassemble everything and get the whole thing transported back over to the house. I decided to add one more measure of security when reassembling the table back at the house and added a bead of Total Boat's thick sew epoxy between the apron and the underside of the top, once again just to really prevent any sagging over time. And the Tapcon screws weren't going into the underside of the top a whole lot and I figured that a little extra epoxy wouldn't be a bad idea here. And this thick sew is super simple to use as the mixing tip allows you to apply the epoxy with a caulk gun really easily. And once that was done, we could move the table into place on the patio and call this project officially complete. All right, hopefully you guys enjoyed this one. I'd say for my first GFRC project, this turned out pretty well, and hopefully all of my future GFRC projects will just get better from here. So again, I'll have links to all of the tools and materials I use throughout the video in the video description below in case you're interested there. Also, if it's your first time here, why not go ahead and get subscribed and ring that little notification bell so you don't miss my future videos. And last, I wanna say a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters as well as my YouTube members. Thank you guys so much for your support. I'll have links to both of those programs on the screen and in the video description below. All right, thanks for watching y'all, and until next week, Happy building.